today's story is about the demise of the Chosun dynasty and the Japanese colonial period. So this material sets the scene for our journey into the contemporary politics of North Korea, the Korean Peninsula and Northeast Asia. I'm going to argue that the division of Korea in 1945 was a direct result of the rupture of a millennia old political order. To make this case, there's six points that I'm going to explore in this video. Korea in the Sinocentric or Sinic world order, the breakdown of this Sinic world order, the internal decay of Chosun Korea, the realities of the Japanese occupation of Korea, the birth of modern nationalism during the occupation, and finally, the legacies of the Japanese empire in Korea. Prior to 1945, Korea had been a single unified political entity for a thousand years, dating back to the establishment of Koryo in the 10th century. Now, just as an aside, Koryo, this is where the name Korea comes from, and it derives from Marco Polo's translation of the Chinese name for Koryo. The Kingdom of Chosun was established in 1392 through a coup by the legendary figure Yi song -ge, who established the Yi dynasty. By the late 19th century, Chosun under the, under the Yi dynasty had been established for over 500 years, which is a remarkable run of political stability. The result of this millennium of political unity and long entrenched socio-economic and political structure was a strong, unique Korean identity, which remains even today on both sides of the DMZ. Chosun was nested within the Sinocentric tributary system. So this was the regional political system of East Asia that predominated prior to the European state system. Now the European state system, that's the world order or the political system that covers the entire world now, as we understand it. But that was exported by the European colonial powers. This map here is from 1809 and it illustrates Chosun Korea as a tributary of Qing Dynasty China. Our next key point about Korea's historic strategic context is its traditional position within this China-centric tributary system. So as a tribute state, the Chosun King paled fealty and submission to the Chinese emperor and offered tribute which was a regular tax paid to the Chinese emperor as a demonstration of that fealty. In return, Korea was for the most part left alone by China to administer its own affairs, though it still remained squarely within China's sphere of influence. Another important point about Korea's position within the Sinocentric tribute system is its place in relation not just to China, but also to Japan. And Korea has been wedged between China and Japan and was periodically victim to incursions from Japan at various points through history. And one episode that I want to share with you that I think is very important for understanding modern context goes back to the 16th century with the Imjin Wars. Now the Imjin Wars sprang up from the desire of a samurai war horde called, called Toyotomi Hideyoshi who'd reunited Japan after centuries of civil war and had designs on conquest in Ming China as well. So Hideyoshi had launched an incursion into Korea and in response, Ming China sent troops to Korea to support the Chosun allies. Now one episode within this war concerned the legendary Chosun naval general Yi Sun Shin who defeated the Japanese Navy in a series of engagements and helped turn the tide of the war and repel the Japanese. Uh, and Yi Sun Shin's statue is in Gwanghwamun Square in modern day Seoul. You can see this illustrated in the corner of the slide here. Now, although the Japanese were ultimately repelled, the Indian Wars were a calamity for Korea at the time, comparable in scale of calamity to the Korean War in the 20th century. And this left Chosun weakened for centuries. So an important observation from the Indian Wars is that it illustrates the Korean Peninsula as an invasion corridor and as a battleground for Sino-Japanese warfare, particularly before the pre-industrial era when maritime force projection was limited. So the shortest land route between Japan and China going either way was through Korea. Uh, 
So this leads us to a simple observation of geography. If we're thinking about Korea's strategic environment, what are the implications of where Korea actually sits geographically? So we can see, just looking at a map, the Korean peninsula sits at a strategic junction in Northeast Asia. It's a historic pathway of interaction between China and Japan. It's a route of cultural and economic exchange. So there's been heated debates in the region in recent times over the origins of cultural practices and shared cultural legacies. So it's not just a military invasion corridor, although it has been that, but it has been this, this highway of interaction between Japan, Korea and China. But what that's meant is that for Korea, Korea is the small party between these two larger powers. So it's often been referred to as the shrimp between two whales. So while conflict did occur from time to time within the Sinic regional system, this regional order as a whole had been predictably stable for many centuries. And Chosun had developed a method of survival and prosperity within this regional system as the shrimp between two whales, in which it developed a mode of being that favoured insularity over openness. Now, we often hear North Korea referred to as the Hermit Kingdom today. However, that name has earlier origins, and that comes from Western visitors to Chosun Korea in the 19th century, who referred to Chosun as the Hermit Kingdom because of the conservatism of the Yi dynasty court and the country's monarchic agrarian bureaucracy, as well as its insularity from the outside world and the common resistance to the wave of change that was sweeping Asia through industrialization and modernity. That these Western observers were in Korea at all to make these observations in the 19th century was a sign that Chosun's splendid isolation was coming to an end. The breakdown of Chosun Korea in the 19th century paralleled the breakdown of the wider Sinic regional system in which it existed. Now at the core of this Sinic regional system, China's Qing dynasty was also in turmoil, was undermined by wars with Western powers, as well as destabilizing internal rebellions, along with the social degradation caused by widespread opium addiction, and the corruption and intrigue at the imperial court in the Forbidden City in Beijing. As a consequence, Qing China was not able to maintain Korea within its sphere of influence because it, it, it had itself had been weakened. The Western imperialism that had cracked open and divided China, that had precipitated Japan's Meiji restoration, was also beginning to encroach on Korea. So we saw in 1871, American gunboats sailing up Korea's rivers, trying to force Chosun open to American trade as they'd done previously in Japan. So this photo here shows the SS General Sherman, which was sailed up the Taedong River to Pyongyang in 1871. This is a very famous incident. Russia was also expanding its empire in, in the Russian Far East and into Manchuria and had designs on expanding its sphere of influence into Korea. Japan had its own ambitions on expansion into Korea. As early as 1876, the Japanese had forced Chosun into signing away political and economic concessions through the Treaty of Gunghua. Companies from abroad had established monopolies over newly built railroads and other utilities. So not just American, Russian and Japanese interests, but there were British companies there, there were other European uh, corporate entities involved. Everyone was trying to get a piece uh, of the opening of Chosun and its uh, new economy. All the while, while this was happening, the divided Chosun court fell prey to the scheming of these foreign powers. So American gunboat diplomacy did have a prior lineage in Northeast Asia before 1871 and the SS Sherman expedition. So if we go back as far as 1853 with the Perry expedition to Japan, this was the moment that saw Japan open up to foreign influence in the 19th century. And Japan's response to this was what ended up kicking off its ascendancy to great power status in a very short period of time. So. The Perry expedition 
ended up precipitating a military coup in 1868 that ended the centuries-old Tokugawa shogunate and restored Japan to the direct rule of the Meiji Emperor. So this then precipitated a period of rapid modernization and rapid industrialization, which saw Japan very quickly emerge as a great power through the end of the 19th century. Japan's ascendance decisively tipped the balance of power in the Sinic regional system and, hel and helped to irrevocably break that system. Japan's dominance of the region became very clear after its victories over China in 1895 and Russia in 1905. In short wars, which cleared the way for Japanese expansion into mainland Asia via the Korean Peninsula. So Korea was Imperial Japan's first annexation on the Asian mainland, and consequently it suffered the longest occupation. Korea became the logistical base for Japanese expansion into Manchuria and then into China. You can see the, the progression of this expansion on the map on the slide here which documents Japan's expansion into Korea, Manchuria, China and beyond. So as Joseon Korea is becoming trapped by this web of external forces, it's also starting to fall apart internally as well. So Joseon was organized as an agrarian bureaucracy. So this has some similarities with European feudalism as a, a mode of political economy, although it is a distinctive system in many important ways. So Choson's agrarian bureaucratic structure was divided into five basic levels, which is, was not just a class system, but it was a structure that illustrates a complex web of economic and social relationships. And it was these economic and social relationships, as they started to come under stress and break down through the 19th century, that's part of the story of how Chosun began, began to fall apart. So let's look at this structure. At the top of the society was the king, who could exercise absolute authority and had ultimate say in all matters, followed by other members of the royal E family. So we can see the members of the royal family are depicted here in the late 19th century in the top graphic. So the next strata down in the hierarchy was occupied by the Yangban, who were, were aristocrats who worked mainly as civil officials or as military officials, as scholars and other high level positions in Choson society. Below them, you have the Chungin, the middle people, so these are the technocrats and the, the illegitimate children of the Yangban. Below the Chungin were the Sangmin, or the common people. So these were the people who worked as craftsmen, farmers, fishermen, or as laborers and merchants and peasants. And this, this group, the Sangmin, comprised approximately 75% of the population and were essentially the productive backbone of the Chosun economy. At the bottom level of the Choson uh, societal hierarchy were the Chomin, or the lowborn or despised people. So this included slaves and servants, concubines, beggars and nomads, as well as Buddhist monks and nuns and the shamans. As the 19th century progressed, we started to see this agrarian bureaucratic social structure begin to break down. The monarchy became weak, the young band became more powerful, but also more insular in the face of foreign pressures. And traditional social roles became undermined by the encroachment of modernity and foreign ideas. And we also started to see agitation from below, from the people at the lower levels of the social hierarchy. That agitation from below was really important to the story. And it took the form of a series of attempted coups and peasant rebellions that escalated through the 19th century and culminated in the Donghak movement and the Donghak rebellion. So the Donghak movement itself began in 1860. Uh, it preached a religion that combined a unique mix of elements of Confucianism, Buddhism, Taoism, Shamanism, and imported Catholicism. You can see its founder illustrated here. So this was a bankrupted aristocrat named Che Jie U, who you can see here on the right. 
Now, the Dong Hak movement called for social reforms that were based around class equality and anti-Western nationalism. So very much responding to the degradation of the Choson system, as well as ideas coming in from the West, but also a rejection of the West more broadly in terms of the encroachment of people and power. The Dong Hak movement culminated in a widespread peasant uprising in 1894, spearheaded by a vanguard of the Sangmin and Chomin classes. So these are the lower levels of the class hierarchy. In response, the king called on China for military assistance to quell the uprising. However, upset at the presence of Chinese forces in Korea, Japan also sent troops into Korea, but uninvited. So what we saw was Chinese and Japanese forces, they end up clashing in Korea, and this is the spark for the first Sino-Japanese war. China's defeat in that war and Japan's subsequent victory over Russia in the Russo-Japanese War a decade later cleared the way for Japan's annexation of Korea. In the aftermath of the Donghak Rebellion and the First Sino-Japanese War, this did usher in a brief period of modernist reform in it, reformism in Korea. But as in China, it was too little, too late to prevent dynastic collapse and eventual annexation by Japan. Insularity and political instability from below was compounded by political intrigue at the top within the monarchy. So what we saw there was a competition between the young King Kojong, his wife, Queen Min, and Kojong's father, the regent Daewongon, who'd ruled Choson as the king's regent until Kojong had come of age. So this, this uh, three-headed monster, if you like, this is an epic tale of self-destruction at the top through the late 19th century in Choson. This intra-family competition was fueled and exploited by officials from China, Japan, and Russia, all in their own way, jockeying for position in Korea. So the conservative Daewongon favored maintaining the old links with China and was very conservative and anti-reformist. Queen Min was much more reform-minded and was pro-Japanese. King Kojong was caught between them and ended up being a political football, kicked around by the external powers. This all illustrates the context in which Choson was so ill-prepared for the challenges brought from outside by Western powers and by newly industrialized Japan. And Japan at this time was rapidly emerging from its Meiji Restoration as the great power in the region in its own right. So this is where we see a rupture point around the turn of the 20th century. The collapse of the Yi dynasty and the demise of Chosun, along with the crumbling of the Sinocentric tribute system in East Asia, of which Chosun Korea was a part. So it's not just that the political order collapsed, the entire structure of Chosun society crumbled around it. And Korea was ripe for the taking. In 1897, Choson was made a Japanese protectorate and then was formally annexed by Japan in 1910. From 1910, the Japanese colonial administration immediately started attempting to undermine and dismantle the old Choson system. And it's not just that they, the Japanese took power in Korea, it's that they deliberately erased the old order in order to maintain imperial control. So first, there was the obvious reality of Japanese troops on the ground, exercising control through force. But the method of colonial control went further. So this photo here shows the Japanese colonial headquarters in Seoul, which was built on the grounds of the Kyungbokgung Palace as a symbol of domination. After the death of King Kojong, the last Korean ruler, the young crown prince was forced to marry a Japanese princess and to live in Japan, so shunted out of the way and incorporated into the Japanese imperial bloodline. For the Japanese, the erasure of the Yi dynasty ensured that the restoration of the monarchy could not become a rallying cry for anti-colonial resistance. 
The Japanization of the media and of the education system was another means of social control enacted by the colonial regime. There was media censorship. So in 1907, Japan brought in the newspaper law, which outlawed local publications. So you had a very Japan-centric media narrative which came to predominate. Illustrated here is a page from the Seoul-based newspaper, the Chosun Mainichi Shimbun from 1933. Koreans have their own alphabet called Hangul, which is a phonetic script and one of the great cultural innovations of human civilization over the last 500 years. But nonetheless, use of Hangul was outlawed and all documents needed to be written in Japanese. Later, in 1940, Koreans were told to give up their Korean family names and take Japanese surnames. Children couldn't go to school and adults couldn't get jobs unless they changed their names. Public education was conducted in the Japanese language. However, it wasn't just that the curriculum was taught in Japanese. The colonial administration instituted a modern mass education model teaching the technical literacy and numeracy required to produce productive workers and technocrats for a modern industrial society. So this mir mirrored the changes to education systems that we saw elsewhere around the world uh, as a, a corollary of industrialization. Now this was radically different from the education system of Chosun Korea, which emphasized deep study of the Confucian classics. If education is the means by which a society reproduces itself, the type of society reproduced through the new education system would become radically different from that of Chosun. Think through the implications of this epistemic erasure, of this assault on Korean culture. It all but severed the cultural connection of the Korean people to the heritage of pre-colonial Chosun. And it was also a humiliation for the Korean people. Now, while Korean culture has been remarkably resilient through the dramatic changes of the 20th century, enough of a cultural vacuum was created that made space for transformative ideas of modernity and modernization, even when the Japanese educational system melted away after 1945. So there's a cultural vacuum there that needs to be filled by something. So bear this in mind also when we touch on the political vacuum shortly. The relationships and the structure of the socioeconomic order of the class system in Chosun Korea was upended by the demands of the Japanese empire. Many men were sent to Japan to work as forced laborers in industry and agriculture. Many other men were conscripted into the Japanese Imperial Army to fight for Japan in Manchuria and China. Many Korean women were forced to become comfort women, conscripted sex slaves for the Japanese military. And the trauma of this experience still reverberates today. All of these conscriptions were facilitated through population displacement. So for example, this is the origin of the Zainichi Korean diaspora community that exists in Japan today. Like all colonies, Korea was bled dry by the economic demands of the colonizing power. Appropriation of produce and resources for consumption in Japan and for consumption by the Japanese war machine was enormous. The Korean Peninsula was an industrial base for the Japanese Imperial Army's expansion into Manchuria and beyond. Now this had implications for later economic models in Korea post-1945. But during the occupation, by 1945, when it finished, Japan held almost 85% of all property in Korea, of which 83% was owned by the Japanese government or by the large Japanese conglomerates called the Zaibatsu. However, there were collaborationist Korean families who built great wealth during the Japanese occupation as part of the colonial industrial machine. And some of these families went on to become the Chebol conglomerates in South Korea. Industrialization and urbanization transformed socioeconomic relationships across Korean society 
by changing the material circumstances that shaped those relationships. So if we look at industrialization, in industrializing Korea as the base of operations for the Japanese Imperial Army in mainland Asia, the colonial regime also transformed the Korean economy from one that was centered on agriculture to one that was increasingly built around industry. So that's a huge change in the structure of the economy. And as a part of this, you get urbanization. So that's the transformation of key urban centers into European looking cities as industrialization brought agrarian populations into the towns and cities to work in these industries. The dramatic transformation of the structure of the Korean economy and the solidification of urban settlement patterns made it impossible for the old order of the agrarian court economy or the agrarian court bureaucracy to be reinstated because the material basis for that system no longer existed. So whatever political system was to emerge after liberation, so after Japan's defeat in 1945, it inevitably could be nothing like the order that existed before the Japanese occupation of Choson. So it's in this crucible of massive change, of occupation and of trauma that we get the formation of a new modern Korean nationalism that starts to shape both Koreas after 1945, after liberation. In an influential article from 1969, Mustafa Rajai and Cynthia Enlow define nations in the following way, quote, nations are, are, are a relatively large group of people who feel that they belong together by virtue of sharing one or more such traits as common language, religion or ethnicity, common history or tradition, common customs and common sense of destiny. As a matter of empirical observation, None of these traits need actually exist. The important point is the, that the people believe that they do." Unquote. Now, while Korean national identity was already strong after a thousand years of political unity, it had been insular and based on the traditional Neo-Confucian notions of hierarchy. But during the Japanese occupation, Korean nationalism started to evolve into something new, incorporating new ideas and new political philosophies from the West. The attempt to erase Korean culture was an attempt to undermine the threat of Korean nationalism as a mobilizing idea for popular resistance. Crushing Korean nationalism became an especially pressing concern for the Japanese colonial government after the March 1st movement in 1919 which was the first large scale popular uprising against colonial rule in Korea. This uprising, the March 1st movement or Samil movement, saw up to 2 million Koreans protest in demonstrations around the country. The Japanese suppressed this uprising with force. Their response was replete with mass killings and arrests. And you can find graphic photos of public executions online if you search for it. Uh, it was a brutal suppression of this movement. But nonetheless, the March Verse movement was an inspiration for later uprisings and a huge inspiration for Korean nationalism ever since. The document illustrated here on the left is the Korean Declaration of Independence, which was read aloud to huge crowds in Seoul on March the 1st, 1919. Paper copies of this were also distributed to other parts of Korea at the same time. The activists who publicly read this aloud in front of City Hall in Seoul proclaimed, we here proclaim the independence of Korea and the liberty of the Korean people. Now, when you read through this document, it's remarkably restrained and it's self-reflective. It shows an awareness of the long decay of the Chosun dynasty. Quote, we must first blame ourselves before finding fault with others, unquote. You can also see in the text inspirations from Woodrow Wilson's 14 points for national self-determination, which was released around the same time at the Versailles Peace Conference in France. Korea was represented at Versailles, 
But their delegation had no great power backing and uh, Japan, all Japan's claims were backed up by the European great powers of Versailles. The declaration also incorporated many different ideas in, ex in its expression of grievance against the Japanese occupation, including traditional ideas from the past, such as its reference to generations of ancestors, as well as new ideas emerging in global politics at the time, such as liberty and national self-determination, and a progressive rising global consciousness. Indeed, the Japanese occupation ushered in the integration of political ideas from the West, particularly through the various resistance movements. We see liberalism in the rhetoric of the March 1st movement, but we also saw the adoption of communism by resistance partisans who were fighting the guerrilla war against the Japanese, variously allied with Russian and Chinese comrades. The picture here is from North Korean propaganda de depicting Kim Il-sung leading his Korean communist partisans into the battle against the Japanese. Korea was also increasingly incorporated into the global capitalist economy, which Chosun had previously resisted. So this is one of the consequences of the industrialization of Korea during the occupation. Doing capitalism, so to speak, also brings with it capitalist class politics. And it's this class politics that exploded in both its embrace and rejection in the aftermath of liberation. A final point to note on the emergent Korean nationalism was that it did not evolve into a victorious liberation movement. Korea's liberation from Japan was secured by the United States and its allies in defeating Japan in the Pacific War, not by the Korean people themselves. The photo here documents Japan's formal surrender aboard the USS Missouri on September the 2nd, 1945. Layered onto the trauma of the occupation and its long history of being wedged between China and Japan, this liberation from outside left Korea and its northern and southern incarnations with wounded nationalisms formed through victimization and trauma, with no experience of throwing off the imperial yoke to catalyze a more triumphant nationalism and worldview. So this would leave an imprint on the thinking of future leaders in North and South Korea after 1945 on how they conceptualized national security. The occupation created a number of legacies for Korea. It scraped away the remnants of Chosun as a viable political system and ensured that there could be no reversion to the dynastic succession after liberation. It created the internal socioeconomic antagonisms that helped to solidify the division of the Korean Peninsula between 1945 and 1950, which eventually exploded into the Korean War. And the occupation also embedded modernity in Korean society and laid the foundations for the later industrialization and material development of both South and North Korea. This photo of Japanese military officers taunting a senior Yangban speaks to the broader humiliation of the occupation for the Korean people. The occupation left a legacy of trauma. After 1945, this played out in the ongoing pain of those who lived through it, as well as family inherited trauma. From a psychological perspective, one could interpret the Korean War possibly as an incredible release of pent-up trauma. Another key legacy relates to the people's everyday choices about how to get along day to day in an occupied country. To collaborate or to resist. People's day to day survival choices during the occupation ended up forming the basis for post occupation ideological splits and the settling of old scores. So there was a post-colonial power vacuum in the immediate period following liberation, which is very normal uh, in the process of decolonization. This vacuum was a factor in the longevity of the partition and the contestation over who would ultimately become the legitimate government of all of Korea. Uh, and as we know, that question still hasn't been settled. <laughs> 
So what can we learn from this story that's more generally applicable across other societies? The fall of Chosun shows us that the international system is always changing and it's always evolving, and that no country can fully isolate itself from global forces. Also, a society can never escape the ghosts of its past. The Japanese occupation left a political, social and economic imprint that irrevocably changed Korea. And finally, international relations is not a chess game. It impacts the lives of real people who experience real trauma from the upheavals of political change. The collective outlet of that trauma itself becomes part of the political upheaval. So in summary, here's some of the key takeaways from this video, which might be helpful as you prepare for the assessments. By all means, pause this and go through these point to point as you do your revisions. Oh, no, so